During the 16-bit era of gaming, Sega were on top of the gaming world, with the likes of Sonic the Hedgehog helping the Sega Mega Drive to become one of the most popular and celebrated game consoles the planet had ever seen. To this day, in this regard, not much has changed, as Sega continue to release devices and compilations showcasing the greatness of this golden age. But what the company continued to ignore, comparatively, is the four home platforms they produced that followed their Blast processing powerhouse. So while Sega ignore how much you love their cornucopia of classic consoles, fortunately Big Daddy Top Hat has you covered. So with that said, join me today as we discuss the history, significance and games of the Sega CD, 32X, Sega Saturn and of course, the beloved Sega Dreamcast. Hello ladies and gentlemen, let's look at some of the stunning Sega systems that everyone needs in their game room. Yeah! The Sega Mega CD was released in this country back when I was incredibly young, only 7 years old in fact, and the only consoles I had experienced with as of yet was the NES, Super Nintendo and Sega Mega Drive. Everything else that was on the market or that was announced to soon come to market was just weird and futuristic to me. I for example had heard of the Atari Jaguar of its 64 bits in the school playground. However, I was not sure whether it actually existed or not or whether this was just playground lies. Then there was all of those futuristic CD-based media devices, a storage medium which I associated with the rich, after seeing Wayne from Wayne's World with a CD player in his car. The CD player appeared in a scene to put over that he was so successful that he could even afford luxury items, but normal people in my eyes just had Super Nintendos or Mega Drives. Everything else was beyond my reach. But on one fateful day, I would stumble across the Mega CD in person. When I was a child, and still now to some degree, I have suffered with severe asthma, often going into attacks. This would lead me to regularly getting hospitalised as a kid, sometimes having to stay there for days on end. Wandering the ward one day, in probably 1994, I stumbled across a young lad the same age as me playing a Sonic game. I had never seen this Sonic game before, but what was most striking about this version of Sonic compared to the others I had seen was the insane sound quality. It sounded like music you would hear on the radio rather than in a video game. This was ridiculous. From that moment I knew I had to try this amazing sounding game for myself. I had always enjoyed playing my Super Nintendo at home with my friends and Sega Mega Drive around friends houses. So being the sociable young chap that I was, I approached the other child and asked if I could join him. To my surprise, the other lad was incredibly rude, and not only declined my offer to play games with him, but he told me to go away. It appeared that children who owned Sega Mega CDs had rather bad stinking attitudes, who were not like the friendly faces I went to school with. Witnessing my deflation and cold rejection firsthand, across the ward another boy and his grandmother invited me to play Sonic with them on yet another Sega console I was not yet familiar with. Rather than have my first ever Mega CD play experience, I would instead have my first Sega Master System one, playing its version of both Sonic 2 and Alex Kidd for the first time. This fond memory of sharing time with this kind boy and his grandmother while I was in hospital has stuck with me to this day. The kid with the 8-bit system treated me a hell of a lot better than the wealthy one with the expensive add-on, eventually leading to the Master System being the first ever game console I purchased for nostalgia purposes, grabbing one when I was about 14 years old in the year 2000. But over the years, the Mega CD which I didn't play would still hang in my mind. But let's discuss more about my personal experiences later. As for now, let's discuss the history of the device that I never got the opportunity to play in its prime. As strange as it may seem today, given how long it's been since they had any kind of real influence on the industry, back in the early 90s Sega were an absolute gaming powerhouse, competing with and even at one point usurping Nintendo as top dogs in the home console market. It truly was the peak period of their blast processing and blue hedgehog powered success, and a big factor in that success was always trying to stay one step ahead of its competition, or in this case, one step ahead of Nintendo and that pesky little mustachioed plumber. With compact disc technology starting to come into its own, and Sega being well aware that their sworn mortal enemies over at Nintendo Towers already had designs on partnering with an outside electronics company to make their own CD device, they set about creating a CD add-on for their popular Mega Drive console. 
with a launch date of October 1988 in Japan and August 1989 in North America, Sega's Mega Drive Genesis had the jump on Nintendo by just over two years, with their competing Super Famicom SNES console not arriving in Japan until November 1990 and the States by August of 1991. This two-year advantage, coupled with some seriously aggressive marketing, a shift in targeted demographic and a little help from a certain red sneaker-wearing anthropomorphic purveyor of 90s chewed, helped Sega not only gain a serious amount of traction and recognition, but actually overtake Nintendo as the biggest video game company in America. At least for a while. Sega's forward-thinking philosophies were not merely confined to this new console, as they realised that the video game technology was constantly evolving and their current system wasn't going to remain cutting edge for too long. The move from cartridges to compact discs was one that Sega were very interested in. Not only did they offer a significant increase in the amount of memory storage on offer for games and interactive media, almost 320 times more than the Mega Drive cartridges in fact, but they were also a whole lot cheaper particularly with the rising cost of microchips at that time. Staff at the Sega Research and Development Labs, led by head Tomio Takai, were tasked with designing and creating a CD-ROM add-on for the system, after news began circulating that NEC were planning on launching a similar add-on for their PC Engine console. That particular bit of kit, simply called the PC Engine CD-ROM, was released to Japan in December of 1988, and the original plan was for the Mega CD to match its specs and capabilities, although the ambitious folks over at Sega eventually decided to try and push things much further. The decision was made to both double the internal RAM and add custom chips that could recreate the dizzying scaling and rotation effects found in some of Sega's most popular and impressive arcade games of the time, such as Space Harrier and Afterburner. A similar combination of scaling and rotation was used to great effect by Nintendo years later in their custom Mode 7 for the SNES which brought it a little more in line with Sega's CD system. Unbelievably, a processor was also added to the Mega CD, which would clock in at almost double the speed of the one found in the original Mega Drive. That's right folks, double the speed of blast processing. Bloody hell. All these added chips and fancy new fandangled technology meant the cost of manufacture and therefore the prospective selling fee of this new hardware was rising to slightly worrying levels, with the launch price looking to be around $370. Not exactly small change. Sega remained undeterred however, as their market research team determined that the public would be absolutely fine, a okay no problemo with such bloody ridiculous prices, given that they would be getting such a powerful and state of the art bit of hardware. The drawback to this powerful hardware however was that, as it was only an add-on, it was still running through the original Mega Drive and was therefore still beholden to its parent console's colour palette limitations and low resolution. Just a piffling 64 colours on screen at once, which didn't exactly make all those FMV games the easiest to look at, or kindest on the eyes. A partnership was made with electronic giants JVC to assist with the design and manufacturing of the new system, which would help with the original model's memorable sleek look and modern hi-fi stack aesthetic. The sexy looking add-on would sit snugly underneath the Mega Drive and feature the motorized tray with the kind of action that even Alan Partridge would be proud of. Further to this, it would have a somewhat unnecessarily complicated display that was clearly intended to mimic the look of the kind of high-end component stereo equipment that was popular at the time. Despite it being very distinctly 90s looking, it manages to have a timeless quality that still gives it a classy, contemporary appearance as of now. Sega of Japan were very protective of their new baby and went all out to keep the specs and final details about the add-on secret, even going so far as to refuse to send a working unit to their supposed colleagues over at Sega of America. Although initially a bit understandably miffed about being left in the dark about many aspects of the project early on, Sega of America were apparently extremely optimistic about the future of CD-based technology and the Mega CD, with our old pal Tom Kalinske promising what he described as movie graphics with a rock and roll concert sound. Tremendo. As JVC were currently in the process of working on a standard for the new CD plus G format, it was only natural that the ability to play such discs would also be incorporated into the Mega CD's already rather complicated innards. This meant that the clever device could play Mega CD games, audio CDs, as well as CD plus Gs, 
They don't call it Mega for nothing, you know. CD plus G is an almost forgotten audio with low-res video hybrid format, often used for karaoke and music video releases. A surprising amount of games consoles can actually recognise these discs, including some nice obscure ones such as the Philips CDI, the 3DO, the Amiga CD32 and even the wonderfully useless Atari Jaguar CD. The games console with the unfortunate distinction of being the system that most resembles a lavatory in design. Unfortunately, the CD plus G format never really took off in any kind of meaningful way and didn't particularly add anything to the Mega CD's appeal or perceived value for money. The finished Mega CD was eventually made available to the public when it launched in Japan in December of 1991, just in time for Christmas, with a somewhat alarming and rather disappointing two games available on release day. Given just how much time and effort had been put into the development of the new hardware, it seemed strange that the initial software side of things was so lacklustre. To compound matters further, the two launch games Soul Feast and Heavy Nova weren't particularly well received, with Heavy Nova taking a particularly harsh shellacking from critics. Even more baffling was the fact that neither of the titles were Sega developed games. One would think that having some recognisable intellectual properties or arcade favourites available from the off would be a priority for the Japanese company, but apparently not. It did seem as though Sega themselves were having difficulty developing games for the system, as they would only manage two titles during the first five months of its release, with many of the expected arcade ports and familiar characters simply not arriving. Although initial sales figures looked promising, with around 200,000 consoles being purchased within the first three months, consumer dissatisfaction was clear and Sega were having some trouble shifting units after the early buzz had died down, with only a further 100,000 being sold in the entire following year. The relatively small install base of Mega Drive owners in Japan certainly didn't help the Mega CD sales or marketability, but it did leave Sega feeling more hopeful about how the device would fare on American shores. If they wanted to make sure their CD system didn't end up a complete flop, it was clear they would have to shift focus on trying to make its success in that region a reality. The renamed Sega CD made its merry way over to the good old United States of America in October of 1992, amid a veritable sea of hype and bombastic over-the-top advertising. Accompanied by the slogan, Welcome to the Next Level, the US marketing campaign for the system encapsulated the super-annoying chewed of this era, perhaps better than almost anything else. Maybe it was the stuff like this that made the boy I stumbled across who owned the Mega CD such a dick. In fact, this wave of advertisements for the Sega CD might be the most 90s thing to have ever existed. More 90s than Chandler Bing listening to the Spice Girls on a portable CD player while drinking a can of Tab Clear. Similar to the Genesis Does campaign, Sega were trying desperately to appeal to the cooler, slightly older teens and young adults demographic, while simultaneously distancing themselves as much as possible away from Nintendo's safe, sterile and family-friendly image. The crazy adverts were absolutely everywhere at the time and they screamed at you as loud as they possibly could, with seizure-inducing cuts and effects designed to be a complete bombardment of the senses. There was also a heavy emphasis put on the system's ability to handle video playback and FMV-based games, with many of these titles being put at the forefront of the advertising. Sega announced a partnership with developers Digital Pictures, who are responsible for many of the full-motion, video-heavy, interactive movie-type games available for the system, and this partnership was clearly meant to be a big deal. Despite their best efforts, however, the American launch of a Sega CD was not without problems, as massive production issues meant only 50,000 units were ready for release day. Sega did manage to turn things around relatively quickly though, as they'd managed to shift over 200,000 of the futuristic little boxes by the end of the year, three months later. As far as the games went, there was a much more respectable looking lineup for the US launch, when compared to the embarrassing Japanese one with Sega promising a whopping 20 games for lucky retailers to choose from on launch day. Unfortunately, those promises turned out to be big, fat, stinking, whopping lies, as only 10 games were actually available on the day of the release. In an attempt to soften the blow, Sega went all in on the packing titles in an effort to make the product seem more immediately appealing and tempt potential buyers who might have been on the fence about committing to such a hefty purchase. 
In addition to the console itself, for $300 you got Soul Feast, Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective and Sega Classics Arcade Collection featuring upgraded ports of improved CD quality audio of the Mega Drive favourites, Streets of Rage, Revenge of Shinobi, Columns and Golden Axe. As if that wasn't enough, also tucked away in the box was a CD plus G sampler and an audio CD sampler of contemporary hits from the time. Not a bad deal really. Just a shame there was nothing to fully show off the impressive capabilities of the system, unless of course you were really into grainy FMVs. By the time us Brits got our grubby little mitts on the console in April of 1993, the buzz had all but died out and the appeal significantly diminished due to other, even fancier CD based systems being either in development or already released. Given that the Mega CD wasn't even a self-contained console, but was still commanding a fee of 270 of the Queen's finest pounds, things didn't look great for the unit's future in the UK, or the rest of Europe for that matter. Which would help explain why I didn't know what the Mega CD was until I stumbled across one in person. Having said that, Sega did manage to shift not a too insignificant amount of 60,000 units by August, so things at least started well enough. December of 1993 saw the Sega CD go through its most troubling time, but also ironically its most successful when US Congress got their niggers in a twist about violence in video games and violent games being marketed to children, and sat Congress hearings about the state of the industry. Other games and peripherals were discussed, such as Mortal Kombat and Konami's hilariously named Justify a Light Gun, but the campy, vaguely horror-themed FMV game Night Trap for the Sega CD was the focal point of the debate and was the part of the proceedings that attracted the most press and media attention. Classic stuffy fuddy-duddy caricature of a human, Joe Lieberman, was the head of the anti-video games front and seemed to do everything within his power to make the industry look as bad as possible. As is so often the case with these things however, the media hysteria that surrounded Night Trap as a result of the trial gave it instant notoriety and made it one of the most talked about games of the time. I'm sure we're all familiar with the phrase, any publicity is good publicity, but it seems particularly applicable here, as the trial saw a spike in sales of both Sega CD units and copies of the game Night Trap. Unfortunately, this small but brief change in fortunes was a fleeting one, as early 1994 saw sales plummet again, with Sega seemingly beginning to lose faith in the ill-fated add-on. The writing was on the wall for the Sega CD here, as attention was shifting towards the upcoming 32-bit Saturn console, with resources slowly being pulled away from the Genesis and its add-ons. Other models of the Mega CD were released, such as the revised, more cost-effective and also extremely ugly Mega CD 2 which was designed to go in tandem with the Mega Drive 2. There was the all-in-one CDX, or Multi-Mega as it was known in our region, which actually doubled as a portable CD player, as well as additional independent models created separately by JVC, Pioneer and AWA. None of this helped with sales in any meaningful way, or actually managed to extend the system's lifespan. An over-reliance on lazy FMV games, technical issues, consumers feeling shortchanged by the inordinate amount of Mega Drive ports being released for the system, and an overly high price point all contributed to the demise of a Sega CD, but the fact that it was making the leap to optical disc based technology at a time when neither manufacturers nor developers were quite ready for such a transition meant it was effectively doomed from the start. But of course all of this was then and now is now, so what exactly was it that so many of us missed out on back then that we could have experienced if we had endless money to spend on futuristic expensive hardware? As for myself, this was a question I often pondered, but would get to learn more about the platform as I grew up and retro gaming slowly became on vogue. In 2005 for example, I would finally get to play that Sonic game that I wanted to play in hospital as a kid, but on a Nintendo console of all things, as part of Sonic Gem Collection for the Nintendo GameCube. The sound quality was every bit as good as I could remember. As for the hardware itself, an episode of Angry Video Game Nerd from 2008 would reacquaint many of us with this mysterious platform. While the video was satirical in nature and spotlighted the console in a rather negative light, this just made me and others want to experience the Sega Mega CD even more firsthand. I would finally have a Mega CD to call my own as of 2012, finding it in a clearance box of old consoles at a boot sale for just £10. This same £10 bought me three spare Mega Drives and my first ever Sega Saturn as well meaning that not only did I pay only £2 for the console, the other kid in hospital wouldn't let me play when I was younger, but I scooped up one of the best bargains of my life. I guess eventually 
Big Daddy Top Hat always wins. Yeah. But what for the games that we get to play on the hardware that eluded me for so long? Searching eBay in 2012, it seemed that the majority of Mega CD games still felt rather pricey for what were essentially nothing more than old video games. So if I had paid £2 for a system, I was not really comfortable in paying much more than that per game particularly. So after learning that the hardware had zero copy protection, playing Mega CD would be a combination of buying some of my favourites while using Image Burn software to play others. One of the standout and must own games for the hardware in my opinion is Final Fight CD, the best version of Final Fight that was available in homes at the time that offers up some additional bells and whistles that helps it stand out today as well. While the Super Nintendo version of Final Fight was missing stages, characters and only offered one player mode, this more refined version of Final Fight offered two player co-op, meaning that Mega CD owners could not only play Streets of Rage 2 on the system, but also the awesome game that inspired the Streets of Rage series in the first place. The game's most unique feature is of course its CD audio that makes playing Final Fight sound better than ever before, serving as the cherry on top of an already delicious beat em up cake. Of course next I guess we should turn our attention to Sonic CD, a game with a somewhat polarising reputation. Developed at the same time as Sonic the Hedgehog 3, the title introduces both Amy Rose and Metal Sonic, two characters who remain iconic to this day. The best-selling Sega CD game of all time was praised by many critics, with many claiming that this was the best Sonic game yet. The game, with its CD audio and unique time-travelling feature, certainly turned a lot of heads. However, some criticised the game due to its convoluted stage design. Personally, I for one have always enjoyed this game, and would choose to play this one over any 3D Sonic game any day of the week. It's very decent in my opinion. Night Trap is obviously another one of the big famous ones, however personally, I prefer to play Night Trap using other hardware. It's crazy to think that FMV games were one of the main selling points of the Mega CD when so many systems that were released at the same time, or shortly after, did it so much better. The Philips CDI for example has by far the greatest version available of Thunder in Paradise, and if you want to play Night Trap you are better off experiencing it on a 3DO. It offers up much better full motion video quality than Sega could muster. Thanks to work and design, those who live in the US would be able to experience the amazing Lunar games using the hardware. Thankfully, due to the system's lack of copy protection, it is possible to make copies that PAL systems will read too. Taking advantage of animated cutscenes years before the Sony PlayStation even existed, these were highly immersive JRPG experiences that still hold up well enough now. Largely unnoticed at the time, for those who love strategy role-playing games, the platform has Shining Force CD, which is basically an enhanced remake of the Shining Force games that were available to play on the Sega Game Gear. Shining Force 3 for the Saturn gets loads of love and attention, so this one deserves your attention too. By far one of the most memorable Mega CD games is that of Snatcher, a cyberpunk graphic adventure game developed and published by Konami. This game is designed by Hideo Kojima, the same genius behind Metal Gear Solid. Snatcher is yet another further example of Kojima's mastery, and the Mega CD version of the game was the first time it was ever made available in English. The game was and is lauded for its cinematic presentation and mature themes that were not common in gaming at the time, with Kojima himself identifying Snatcher to contain themes that would be explored more deeply later with the Metal Gear series. Shockingly, this graphic adventure game with visual novel elements is not available to purchase on any modern hardware, instantly functioning as a key reason to play with a Mega CD today. Another game with a hell of a lot of character is Keo Flying Squadron. It's a fun cute em up with bright colourful eye catching graphics that further adds to the Mega CD library's depths. From Thunderhawk, Robo Aleste, Time Gal, Popful Mal, Road Adventure and more, there is plenty of fun to be had with a Mega CD. So to make my point all the more clear, you should buy a Mega CD right now because it has an amazing library of games that can be played on it including Snatcher, there is no copy protection so you do not need to pay ludicrous prices for the pleasure, it is a beautiful piece of machinery that looks like a work of art under a Mega Drive, not owning one new, it represents the missing part of your childhood, and there's no reason to wait as Nintendo are never going to make one. As for the 32X on the other hand, I literally have zero memory of its existence from my youth, which tells you all you need to know about its UK marketing presence. Online records suggest it launched in my home nation around Christmas of 1994, but I guess I was too distracted by the wonders of what was Donkey Kong Country that festive period to care for such an oddity. Like many others out there, I became fascinated with the 32X after seeing it on the Angry Video Game Nerd. 
laughing at the mess of cabling that was required to just enjoy the Genesis while using its two add-ons. From that moment on, I knew I wanted one, an objective I would eventually achieve, but not until about 7 or 8 years ago. I finally tasted the forbidden fruit that is the 32X during my busiest stint as a professional wrestler, buying my unit from wrestling colleagues. In the amusing twist of this tale, I purchased my 32X from the UK Pitbulls, friends of mine who are Europe's heaviest tag team. Again, this is kind of surreal in itself as before I knew them personally, I saw them on Dirty Sanchez as a youngster. You know, the Welsh jackass, where they would force Pancho to lick Bulk's sweaty gooch. I am not sure what is stranger really, the fact that I actually own a 32X, or the fact that one of the previous owners had their gooch licked on national television. You let me know what you think is weirder in the comment section. So that's the strange tale of how I procured this strange device, but why did it exist in the first place? Well, although Sega's legacy within the video game industry is an impressive one, and they will historically always be one of the most remembered and recognisable companies within that sphere, it is rather unfortunate that in more recent years, they are perhaps almost as well known for their trademark balmy decision making as they are for their consoles, games or blue hedgehogs. The mid to late 90s in particular saw the Japanese gaming giants make several curious and puzzling missteps, but some of Sega's most confusing, odd, counterproductive and downright balmy decisions were directly related to one of their most ill-fated, ill-conceived and ill-advised products to date. This unfortunate little add-on was in many ways doomed to fail before it was even launched, and ended up being one of Sega's most costly mistakes. The early years of gaming and the first several generations of home consoles could probably be quite accurately summed up by one simple single syllable word, bits. Despite the fact that nobody had the foggiest idea just what these little so called bits were, how they functioned or how they actually benefited the games and systems they were powering. Several years of very persuasive and cleverly worded marketing and advertising had convinced people they were the absolute be all and end all of a console's capabilities. People might not have quite comprehended just what those little bits were or what they did, but what they knew for sure was more is better. And the unwashed masses were practically salivating at their collective mouths, desperately looking for as many of those sacred bits as they could get their greedy little hands on. Thinking about it, it all seems a bit silly now in retrospect, but the gaming industry, and more specifically the gaming media, had pre-programmed the marketplace into thinking that the progression of the number of bits was the only progression that truly mattered, and they had whipped the public into a frenzy during the early 90s over the imminent upgrade from 16 to 32 bit technology. Sega's massive success with their all-conquering fourth generation powerhouse the Mega Drive meant they were well positioned within the industry to continue making hardware and retain their position amongst the top brands in gaming, but the pressure was on to stay ahead of the curve and remain at the cutting edge. That pressure increased further when those sneaky dogs over at Atari jumped the proverbial line and brought out a supposed 64-bit console in 1993 in the form of the Jaguar or so they claimed at least. Regardless, or however you semantically describe the capabilities of the JAG, it still left the Mega Drive in the dust, in terms of both graphical prowess and those all important bits. And the release of a CD-based 32-bit powerhouse, the 3DO, put yet more pressure on the already overworked staff over at Sega, to slave away even harder on keeping up with the competition. Like the bickering siblings that they so often are, typically it seems that Sega of America and Sega of Japan had very different ideas about how exactly they would make the next step in bit technology, with the Japanese branch of a company eager for a cartridge based 32 bit machine to be developed. While Sega of America were keen to do everything they could to keep the still relatively popular Genesis alive and relevant. In January of 1994, Sega president Heio Nakayama propositioned several Sega of America higher-ups with the concept of developing such a system, with the idea being that it would serve as a something of a sequel to the Mega Drive. Vague plans for this proposed, entirely new, independent console flew around for a while, with it initially being tentatively referred to as Genesis 2. 
After much deliberation and back and forth, the proposal that this new system would be an add-on was agreed to, and Sega of America were tasked with development, while Sega of Japan would provide any extra research or assistance needed. The new piece of hardware was renamed Project Mars, and the poor little Sega elves had to have it finished, tested, packed and shipped, ready for 1994's Christmas season, which was less than a year away. Whilst all this was going on, unbeknownst to Sega America, their sneaky rivals at Sega of Japan were busy developing a 32-bit system of their own, using optical disks and advanced 32-bit processors. This bit of kit would go on to become the Sega Saturn, and it was the console that Sega were planning on pumping all of their resources into, which begs the question, why was Sega's American branch even continuing with such a thankless task? when their Japanese supposed colleagues were in the process of designing something that would render their new system immediately redundant. I really don't know, but continue their thankless task they did. And the eventual design of Project Mars featured two Super H2 processors, which were developed by Hitachi in tandem with Sega during a venture in 1993, and could provide 32,768 colours which was a vast, vast improvement over the Mega Drive's 512. It was also capable of enhanced scaling and rotation, came with two digital sound channels, and most importantly, had support for polygon-based 3D graphics. Project Mars was eventually renamed Sega Genesis Super 32X, and then finally shortened to just the 32X, before being unveiled in prototype form at the Summer Consumer Electronics Show of 1994 in Chicago. The system went over pretty well, and judging by some of the shady footage they showed of games in development, it's not hard to see why. Looking at some of this footage now, compared to the finished games we actually got on 32X, it's pretty laughable and crazy to think that they got away with claiming that we were looking at future gameplay footage. Ah, the innocent and naive 90s, a time when gaming advertisers could literally get away with anything. Sega also managed to hook people in with an extremely tantalising looking list of developers, all signed on to make titles for the new system, featuring a veritable who's who of development giants, including Acclaim, Activision, Konami and even Capcom. Prior to launch, things were looking pretty good and surprisingly promising for the little add-on that few had any real faith in. This feeling of optimism was soon replaced by one that Sega of America would unfortunately have to get used to over the coming years, and that was the impending feeling of doom and gloom. Things started going very wrong for the not even released yet 32X, when Sega of Japan announced that their upcoming Saturn console would be released natively in November of 1994, literally the exact same time that Sega of America had scheduled the release of their add-on. I mean honestly, it just feels like they're doing it on purpose now. This was a huge blow to Sega America, who were absolutely apoplectic about the news and how it would affect the company, their well established brand loyalty and their future as hardware developers going forward. Although the 32X was being marketed as a quick fix before the next proper big boy consoles arrived, the fact that the Saturn was coming out in Japan at the exact same time made the Genesis add-on seem like not much more than a short-sighted cash grab. Producer Scott Bayliss was quoted as saying, It just made us look greedy and dumb to consumers. You really can't help but feel that Sega America got done dirty here. 3DO head honcho Trip Hawkins referred to the 32X as a band-aid in reference to its relationship to its parent console and the system was fast becoming a bit of an industry inside joke. The Sega Genesis 32X was finally released in North America on November 21st 1994 with a launch price of $159.99 amid a typically over the top bombastic 90s Sega style advertising campaign that cost the company somewhere in the region of $10 million and managed to be a little raunchier and more risque than the previous Genesis and Sega CD ones using slightly more adult themes. Presumably, this was because the young teen demographic they so aggressively targeted in the early 90s would now be a few years older and thus more receptive to such things. 
Although the marketing was fairly successful, the actual system on launch was met with almost immediate negativity, with one of the main complaints being the overly complicated setup required to even play the ugly little thing. Not only did the 32X sit awkwardly on top of the Genesis, looking like some kind of cheap robot mushroom, it also required its own connector cable, AV cable and dedicated power source. What's more, rather than just shove the device straight into the top of your console, it was advised you should use these weird little metal prong thingies and a spacer to ensure proper connectivity and to keep the 32X sturdy inside the Genesis. Although to be fair, the system works absolutely fine without using either of those things. The dedicated power source issue was extremely problematic. If you had a Sega CD as well, you'd need an empty socket for your TV, a socket for your Genesis, a socket for your Sega CD and a socket for your 32X. These aren't little diddy plugs either. These are those huge brick things that could cause serious injury if you should ever drop one on your foot. That doesn't exactly leave much room for anything else now, does it? The other major issue with the system's launch was the games on offer, or rather, lack thereof. Despite Sega promising an extensive choice of games to choose from, only four were available on release, and one of them was the universally panned Cosmic Carnage, a game so bad Sega were actually ashamed of it and didn't even want to ship out. The other three were the excellent Virtual Racing Deluxe, which was by far the strongest launch title, Star Wars Arcade, which proved to be the most popular game for the 32X, and the closest thing it had to a system seller, and well, Doom, which as we know is on everything. Despite all of the issues and missteps, Sega's miracle working marketing campaign had done it again and managed to give the 32X a pretty successful launch, with the system selling 500,000 units by Christmas of 1994 far exceeding their initial sales projection. The add-on was released the following month as the Super 32X in Japan and the Mega Drive 32X over here in PAL regions. And although the Saturn was already available in Japan, giving consumers little reason to pay the 32X any attention, there was initial high demand in Europe, particularly here in the UK, giving the system another successful and dare I say promising launch. Like I said earlier, I must have been too distracted by Donkey Kong Country fever to even care. It might have looked for a brief moment in time like the ugly mushroom that no one wanted to play with might actually defy the odds and succeed, but that fleeting moment was soon gone, and the bubble began to burst on the 32X when the next wave of games for the system started coming out. Hurried, forced release date timelines and development confusion with the overly complicated new hardware led to several very rushed games being released that were in no way making full use of the 32-bit system's new capabilities and did not look close to matching the improvements in graphical prowess that had been promised or that people were expecting. Despite the fact that Sega had teased a new 3D Sonic game at the recent Consumer and Electronics show, it also seemed strange that there was no new Sonic game on the horizon or being talked about at all. Truth be told, things were already looking bleak for the system just a few weeks in, and sales dropped dramatically and rather depressingly immediately following the holiday season, with faith seeming to have been universally lost in the frivolous little add-on. Many devs that had been planning on releasing games for the platform either abandoned the titles completely or transitioned to turning them into Saturn games. Things weren't looking good for the future of the 32X and Sega had little choice but to drop the retail cost of the system to $99.99 by early 1995. This dropped again to $79.99 soon after, and by later in the year, you could pick one up from various stores and discount aisles for as little as $99.99, which to put it in context was a third of the cost of one of the 32X's games on launch. It truly was one of the most sudden falls from grace of any mainstream gaming system, and by October of 1995, less than 11 months after it was released, all future plans for the console were cancelled, and the plug was pulled on the 32X. I wonder if that's the same plug that powered the system and annoyed everyone so much. By the end of the 32X's lifespan, a rather paltry 40 games were released for the device, with some of them requiring both the Mega CD and the Mega Drive to play. This was a bit of a last gasp effort by Sega to try and drum up a bit of last minute interest in the dying system by combining the tech of both of Sega's Mega Drive add-ons. Unsurprisingly, particularly given the games on offer, it failed miserably 
in a similar attempt to try and bleed every last drop of cash money they could out of the utterly redundant 32X technology, there was also plans underway to release a combined Mega Drive 32X console in one standalone unit called the Neptune. But the device was abandoned completely when Sega brought the American launch of the Saturn forward. Shame really, as although it would only serve as an unnecessary curiosity, the sleek prototype designs look rather sexy, and I would like to own one. The story of Sega's final Mega Drive add-on ended up being a bit of a sad one. The 32X was never set up to succeed, quite the opposite in fact. It seems that Sega of Japan were almost opposed to the project to begin with, and their balmy decision making ended up doing unfathomable amounts of damage to Sega's branding in America as well as their standing as a respected company globally. The 32X was a bit of a mess, with a laughable design and a thoroughly inconvenient amount of wires and cables. Looking back, it's no wonder the system was a complete failure. But it's still a bit of a shame, it was never even really given a fair chance. Which is one of the reasons it deserves your forgiveness, despite all of what I've said. But if not being given a long enough chance to flourish isn't enough of a reason for you to give it a chance today, then how about the games it has on offer? Let's begin discussing some of them. Let's start by talking about one of the launch titles for this device, Star Wars Arcade. In my opinion, this is a visually impressive game for 1994 and it controls well. A further nice touch is that classic music is here and arranged nicely from the original Star Wars trilogy, which adds a lot of atmosphere to the game's levels. The game consists of you flying an X-Wing, intercepting TIE fighters in an asteroid field, destroying a Super Star Destroyer and making an assault run on the Death Star. The game is short and sweet and it's overall a very simplistic arcade experience. I suppose this gives the game an excellent pick up and play nature now. Next up we have Space Harrier, a 1985 arcade game which has been freaking ported to everything. I first had my first experience with this game within the arcade in Shenmue and was quite frankly mesmerised. I later got to live my Space Harrier retro arcade experience out in real life too when I got to play it on an actual cabinet at Funspot in New Hampshire. By this point in time Space Harrier had been ported to over 20 systems, often with varying results in terms of quality. The 32X version of this game is a fantastic one, giving a very authentic arcade feel, which is a lot better than the earlier release of Space Harrier 2, which can be found on the standard Sega Mega Drive. On the subject of great arcade ports, we also have Afterburner on the platform, a near arcade perfect conversion I must add. This combat flight, simulator by Yu Suzuki of Shenmue fame, allows the player to control an F-14 Tomcat jet, which you can control to destroy a series of enemy jets throughout 18 stages. Again, just like Space Harrier, this game is fantastic fun and a welcome addition to anyone's collection of Sega 32X games. Next up, we have Mortal Kombat 2. Well, the game is a uh, Mortal Kombat 2, but how good was this version? Well, side by side, it looks better than the Mega Drive version of a game, but not impressive enough of an update for this to provide a great reason to play this particular conversion. The 32X also has WrestleMania the arcade game, which is fantastic fun. The game actually plays more like a fighter than a wrestling game and graphically looks quite similar to Mortal Kombat. This game is absolutely insane and makes no effort to take itself seriously. The game features ridiculous animations such as Yokozuna dropping turkey legs all over the ring and the bloody Undertaker doing ghost hadoukens. It's available on other hardware too but stands out more in the 32X's smaller library. BS Racers is a Mario Kart clone that is a spin-off of the Chuck Rock series of games, so I suppose this game gets to rip off both Mario Kart and the Flintstones simultaneously. Very nice. From my experience with this game, it is nothing special, but at the same time, there isn't that much wrong with it either. It reminds me of Street Racer, another Super Mario Kart clone I remember having back in the day. One of the most iconic games for the 32X is Metalhead. Metalhead is a highly impressive looking game for the period and is a 3D first person shooter mech simulation developed and published by Sega. The game features full textures and mapped polygons. The levels in this game are broken down into missions, though most missions are to destroy all the enemies in that area using the mechs of various projectile weapons. The game is an impressive example of what the first 2X was capable of. It's just a shame there aren't more titles made for it like this. 
Speaking of impressive looking games, aesthetically, one of my favourite looking on the system is Calibre. The game is an odd little shooter where you control a hummingbird, which offers numerous power-ups for the player. Each power-up in the game follows different patterns, including spread shots and homing in on enemies. The game also features several puzzles which grow increasingly difficult with each level. It's a nice addition to the 32X library. Virtual Fighter is one of the earliest examples of a game within the fighting game genre made from polygons. In fact, I think it might be the first game I can recall that uses polygon model characters that I can think of full stop. Virtual Fighter for the 32X came out on the system several months after it had already seen a release on the Sega Saturn, so overall it is far from the best version of the game, but its existence is historically noteworthy, and this is still Virtual Fighter. Another game that was ported to everything, which has a half decent 32X version, is Doom. Due to the game's extra power, it looks much better than the Super Nintendo version, and much better than the abysmal effort featured on the 3DO. It's just a shame that the music got downgraded compared to other ports of this classic PC game, but it does serve as more proof that there are plenty of decent 32X games. A rather striking looking 2D platformer is Tempo. Aesthetically, this is a wonderful looking game with a great art direction. Sadly, the game doesn't play quite as good as it looks, but at least it is a handsome one. Another base is a Japanese space shooter and the only game in the Zaxxon series to feature 3D polygons. I got a fair amount of enjoyment from this strange looking isometric game, which is undoubtedly one of the more unique looking titles within the 32X's library. The game was quite harshly criticised at around the time of release, however I think this one is not too bad, so give it a try if you like. Finally on this list I have left what I believe to be the best till last. Previously, I've heard a lot of bad things about Knuckles Chaotix, however upon experiencing the game myself, I discover most of these claims to be untrue. Knuckles Chaotix is the lost gem within the classic Sonic series. Even utter tripe like Sonic 3D and Sonic Spinball receive regular re-releases, but there is no love for Knuckles. The game introduces the tethering platforming mechanics and features a non-linear order of stages. I like this one, it's a little slower than Sonic, giving us a little more time to think. This is a thinking man's game and reminds me a lot more of Rystar on the Mega Drive in terms of gameplay. It's sad really that unlike most 2D Sonic games, this one doesn't get re-released in compilations every generation. So the fact that this game is on the 32X is one of the strongest reasons as to why you should perhaps forgive the hardware and try it out. As you can see from all of this, the 32X library is actually fairly decent, with plenty of hardware examples being out there that offer up far less interesting exclusives. There may actually even be more interesting exclusives available on the 32X than there is on the Xbox One. All in all, the 32X certainly has plenty of weaknesses and was far from an ideal product for most consumers to invest in. But that doesn't mean there aren't some silver linings to this overall grey cloud, which is why it so desperately deserves your forgiveness. It's a quirky system with a fun little selection of games, but the following generation, things would change drastically. I was fortunate enough that my parents were kind enough to buy me both a Nintendo 64 and a Sony PlayStation, two amazing platforms that were certainly capable of fulfilling my teenage gaming needs. But while I had and loved these, I was more than aware that Sega 2 had released a console that could be experienced during such a period. I am of course talking about the Sega Saturn, the game console that most of us knew existed during its run, but few of us comparatively chose to actually buy. This wasn't the system that many people had much experience with, and instead would be the platform owned by your nerdy friend's weird uncle, or older oh, stepbrother. Normies didn't buy Sega Saturns in the West, so direct nostalgia for the platform is more limited than with many other consoles of our past. In fact, if I'm honest, for a long, long time, I wasn't even aware of the Sega Saturn's top games, and just assumed its top titles were all available on the Sony PlayStation anyway. During my childhood, I remember the likes of Croc, Tomb Raider, and Resident Evil being heavily promoted to be playable on both devices, so my conception of the Saturn was that it was just a more rubbish PlayStation. Little did I know how different the two pieces of hardware truly were. As sales show us, I was far from alone when it came to this line of thinking, but reflecting back as of today, 
I feel that by ignoring the Saturn, many of us collectively made a huge gaming mistake. Because as the years have passed by, the Sega Saturn has slowly become a system that I have gained more and more respect for. Fast forward to 2002, I am moving into my adulthood and I am already looking to buy as many games and consoles as possible that were popular during my youth, with 8-bit and 16-bit titles obviously being by far the cheapest of this period. Retro gaming and collecting would for many years be a fun pastime, but it would not be until 2012 that I would get a Sega Saturn of my very own. No joke, I found my Sega Saturn alongside my Sega Mega CD and a pile of Mega Drives in a box of untested consoles, which the seller sold me for just 10 English pounds. So I had little to lose by making such a purchase. Fortunately, every single piece of hardware in the box worked, and I have been getting increased enjoyment out of what was essentially a £2 purchase ever since. Ah yes, the good old days when people didn't treat tatty old game consoles as an alternative to gold. But even back then it would transpire that there were Sega Saturn titles out there that were already on the pricey side, but we'll get to discussing more about that later. The fact of the matter is, as soon as I started researching the console's library, I would soon discover gem after gem that I was interested in trying. Ten years ago, prices on most Saturn games were significantly cheaper than buying whatever the latest release was on the Xbox 360, so there was plenty of choice out there that I could experience on the cheap. Games such as Knights into Dreams, Guardian Heroes, Saturn Bomberman and Pan's Dragoon had all provided me with hours of fun, but I was only just starting to scrape the Saturn Iceberg at this point. As I fell more and more in love with what felt like the estranged console I should have been playing as part of my childhood, I did something which I felt was absolutely balmy at the time. In 2012, I paid over 100 English pounds for one single video game, Panzer Dragoon Saga, which I had heard many people lauded online as for Saturn's answer to Final Fantasy VII. Was the enjoyment I received from Saga worth the high price point I paid? Well, more on that soon, as before I ramble on any further about my experiences, let's begin digging into this enigmatic console's beginnings, which of course will require us to go back to the dawn of the 90s. Although it was kept very hush-hush at the time, tentative and secretive plans for what would eventually become Sega's next proper console were supposedly floating around from as early as spring of 1992, with the name Saturn at this point being merely a code name for the project. Development of the system was being overseen by Sega's director and deputy general manager of research and development, Hideki Sato, the man responsible for the lion's share of the work of the creation of all of Sega's major home consoles, and the man who would go on to serve as the president of the company from 2001 to 2003. Sato had been with the Japanese gaming giant since April of 1971, and was one of the most respected figures in the entire organisation and the only person Sega would entrust with the responsibility of making sure their new hardware was up to scratch. Given that Sega was still trying to push the Mega Drive and Mega CD at the time, progress on the system was initially slow, but the project would start making some headway when Sega entered into a partnership with electronics company Hitachi to jointly develop a new 32-bit CPU processor for the upcoming hardware. This fancy new creation would come to be known as the Super H RISC engine, or SH2 for short, and would end up being not only the primary processor for the Saturn, but also the Sega's ill-fated Mega Drive add-on. Although the Saturn and the 32X do both use a dual configuration of two of the SH2 chips running in tandem, the big difference and what separated the Saturn as a truly next generation console was that it was also equipped with twin video display processors, named VDP1 and VDP2, making it an extremely powerful and impressive bit of kit for the period. If that wasn't enough, the Saturn would also be equipped with its own custom Motorola sound processor, with a Yamaha FH1 DSP processor inside, giving the system 32 sound channels, FM synthesis and 16-bit PCM sampling abilities. With the hardware's design all but completed by the end of 1993, the main focus of Project Saturn was initially going to be expanding on the foundations laid by the 16-bit Mega Drive, and vastly improving the graphical fidelity and overall visuals of 2D gaming, with little attention put on polygon-based 3D graphics. 
plans, however, would begin to shift somewhat in early 1994, when someone at Sega HQ got wind of Sony's upcoming PlayStation console, which was currently in development and was said to have some rather powerful 3D processing capabilities under its hood. Recognising that this could tempt potential buyers away from Camp Sega and onto Team Sony, the typically overworked little Sega lab rats set about rejigging the Saturn's already complicated innards to get close to replicating the kind of specs found in Sony's new system. Rather than starting from scratch though, the clever people of Sega added several new dedicated processors to the Saturn's inner workings to help with polygon texture mapping and share the workload with the main CPUs when demanding 3D graphics were being displayed. These additions made the already technically impressive Saturn an extremely capable and powerful one by the standards of the time. The only issue was, and this was a fairly substantial issue, was all of those extra chips and processors made the Saturn especially difficult to program for. This was one of the biggest problems that blighted the console throughout its lifespan, as this overly complicated collection of microchips lurking within the Saturn's ample plastic frame meant the system was a nightmare for developers, with even the most skilled finding it extremely difficult to be able to actually make the most of the hardware's impressive specs, and show what the console can really do. To put this in context, despite the overwhelming public perception that the PS1 is superior to its Sega counterpart when it comes to 3D graphics, the Sega Saturn can produce far more textured polygons than the PlayStation, an impressive 140,000 per second compared to the snivelling 90,000 in fact. To compound problems further, it seemed that Sega of America and Sega of Japan had very different ideas about the direction of this new technology, with Sega of America campaigning hard for a new graphics chip to be developed for the system. American branch president Tom Kalinske was quoted as saying, We fought against the architecture of the Saturn for some time. He was supposedly close to brokering a deal with Silicon Graphics about designing a more functional processor of the Saturn. But the proposal was rejected by the stuffy suits of Sega Japan, and Silicon Graphics ultimately took whatever progress they'd made on the project with them over to Nintendo, when they partnered with them on the design of the Nintendo 64. The fact that Sega of America were also busy toiling away on the soon to be released 32X, which was about to be made entirely redundant by Sega of Japan's new Saturn, meant the relationship between the two branches of the company were exceedingly strained with Kalinsky's crew essentially being forced to compete against themselves. Things would come to a head when Sega of Japan announced the launch date for the Saturn on home turf, which would come in the exact same week as the 32X was due to be launched in the States. Released on the 22nd of November 1994 in Japan, at a fairly reasonable price of 48,800 yen, the Sega Saturn completely sold out the initial shipment of 200,000 units in a single day a big part of that rapid success being the enormous popularity of Virtua Fighter, which was a fairly authentic and faithful port of the arcade game, and sold at an almost one-to-one -one rate with the Saturn console itself. That means that almost every single person that bought a Saturn also bought a copy of Virtua Fighter. Myself ended up being one of those people. Sadly though, Saturn offerings were slim pickings at launch. I mean, the only other game available was an obscure FMV and text-based game known as Wan Chai Connection, which is essentially just a load of pictures and text boxes filled with all of that funny Japanese writing. Sega Japan were desperate to also have Pan's Dragoon and Clockwork Knight available on the day of the system's release. However, due to unforeseen development delays, alas, that was not to be. After the initial wave of units sold out, Sega sneakily waited until the launch of the PlayStation on the 3rd of December to ship more to retailers, increasing demand for the system and bringing it to a crescendo just in time for their new biggest rival's console to hit store shelves. An unscrupulous tactic indeed, but one that paid off for Sega, as when the two consoles were sold side by side, the Saturn did prove to be more popular. A tremendous first month for Sega's new hardware, and with several highly anticipated games and big hitters soon to be released, and an upcoming American launch on the horizon, things were looking seriously rosy for the Saturn. By the end of 1994, it looked like history was all but written, with it seeming close to certain the Saturn would end up being the more successful console, having shifted just over half a million units compared to the PlayStation's 300,000. Both Sony and Sega realised, however, that the biggest and most important and most lucrative market at the time was going to be America, so plans started to be drawn up on the best and most conducive ways to crack that market wide open. 
In March of 1995, it was announced by Tom Kalinske that Sega's new console would be released to the States on Saturday, the 2nd of September 1995, cleverly dubbed Saturn Day. This was until perennial mood ruiners Sega of Japan mandated that the release be brought forward, completely out of the blue, to try and give them every possible advantage over Sony's PlayStation, which was also due to launch in September. A good and rather bold idea on paper, but an absolutely terrible one in practice. I'm not here to judge or cast aspersions, but it can't just be me that's noticing that the vast majority of Sega's bad ideas and balmy decision making seems to have come directly from their Japanese offices. With little choice other than yield to the wishes of he's demanding Japanese overlords, on that fateful date of the 11th of May 1995, at the very first E3 event in Los Angeles, with a heavy heart, Tom Kalinske took to the stage and gave a keynote presentation in which he revealed several details about the Saturn and its capabilities, as well as its intended launch price of $399 which, when adjusted to inflation, would be a pretty astonishing $750 in today's future money. He also revealed that the system would come with the immensely popular Virtua Fighter, which took some of the sting away from the hefty asking fee. But next would come the bombshell that absolutely no one expected or was remotely prepared for. Kalinsky let it be known that due to high consumer demand, 30,000 Sega Saturn consoles had already been shipped to various electronics, games and toy stores across the country for immediate release, right there and then, a full four months before the release date everyone expected. Rather than everyone jumping for joy at their surprise as Sega expected, both consumers and retailers were absolutely furious, with several large and influential trains such as Best Buy and Walmart heavily criticising Sega for not forewarning them of any such plans. KB Toys were so indignant that they even went as far as to drop Sega from their upcoming retail line completely. This was an absolutely devastating blow for the company, as KB Toys were one of the biggest toy chains and one of the biggest sellers of video games in the country at that point. To compound matters further, their day was thoroughly ruined when the head of Sony Interactive Entertainment, Steve Race, took to the stage during Sony's inaugural E3, with possibly the biggest mic drop in gaming history. He calmly walked up to the podium as if he was starring in a corporate version of 8 Mile and simply said the words, 2.99, before strutting back to his seat like the coolest man who ever lived to righteous applause. It was the worst news Sega could have possibly hoped for. Sony had undercut them by 25% of the console's value and subsequently taken all of the hype and attention away from the Saturn. The wind had been completely taken out of Sega's sails after the promising Japanese launch, where the future looked bright and sunny. Things had taken a sharp and rather immediate turn, with the console's future now appearing decidedly darker. The somewhat slim selection of six games available on launch in the US wasn't exactly inspiring consumers to rush out and commit to buying a Saturn, which didn't particularly help matters. It's certainly not the worst lineup of launch games ever seen, but it certainly was not a top drawer either. Two sports titles in Sega Worldwide Soccer and Pebble Beach Golf Links, two arcade ports in Virtual Fighter and Daytona USA, the cartoony 2.5D platformer Clockwork Knight, and the on-rail shooter all-time classic Pan's Dragoon. Given that all of the previously announced third-party titles still weren't due until around the system's original September launch, there was a heavy reliance on original Sega titles and ports of Sega-developed arcade games and it was slim pickings for the first few months of the console's life. It also became clear that Virtual Fighter wasn't quite the system seller that it was over in Japan, which meant Sega just didn't have any titles to really capture the American public's imagination, and thus failed to capitalise on their early launch, making it a little more than a rather fruitless and costly stunt. By the time the next batch of games started coming out, Sony's PlayStation was also hitting store shelves, with a far more impressive and attractive lineup of games, including several massively hyped and sought after titles, such as Ridge Racer and Wipeout. Despite Sega supposedly having the advantage, with four extra months worth of consumer based building and brand loyalty, Sony's PlayStation was immediately outselling the Saturn, and literally within a matter of days, they had sold more units than Sega had in those entire first four months. The writing seems to be well and truly on the wall at this point. As for over here in Europe, things weren't looking much better in power regions, with press and retailers completely overwhelmed with the decision to move the Saturn's launch forward by several months, 
leaving them little time to prepare for marketing and selling the troublesome device. Advertising was pretty minimal, particularly over here in the UK, with a surprising lack of visibility for such a supposedly big important console, especially when compared to the PlayStation's ad campaigns, which were absolutely everywhere. Supposedly, Sony spent close to five times the amount of money that Sega did on advertising in the UK, and it showed, as by November, Sony's little box that could was outselling Sega's chunky old Saturn by 3 to 1, bringing reasoning behind me not knowing anyone who owned one during my youth. Things continued to capitulate for the Saturn over the coming months, with Sony's revelatory new system gaining momentum and notoriety at every turn. The PlayStation was becoming an iconic piece of hardware, woven into the fabric of pop culture tapestry, while Sega's Albatross was being overlooked and forgotten. The problematic Saturn hardware meant fewer games were forthcoming, and often the ones that did come out were slightly lesser versions of their PlayStation counterparts, with Sony's exclusive titles proving to be almost universally popular. Although the system maintained a healthy existence in Japan, far outlasting the console in any other region, with significantly more games available, the system's failures in the West started before the hardware was even released. Pair this with an incredibly complicated set of CPUs which gave all developers a massive headache, Sega were in trouble. Further combine this with the amount of confusion, annoyance and brand dissatisfaction that came about as a result of their dubious decision to bring the console's launch forward, insurmountable damage was done. While there is no doubt in my mind that the Sega Saturn has a fantastic library of games that are often overlooked today, the number of poor decisions that Sega would make surrounding the platform would mean that the plan was almost doomed to fail from the start. Now that we have re-familiarised ourselves with the Saturn's launch, I hope I've provided for you a much clearer picture as to why the majority of us chose to bypass this system. But just because the console didn't seem like the sensible choice at the time, doesn't mean it isn't worth owning today, and I can provide plenty of good reasons as to why you may want to pick one of these up as soon as possible. But first and foremost, the most important reason is obviously down to the many great exclusives. As mentioned earlier in the video, the crown jewel in my personal Sega Saturn collection is Pan's Dragoon Saga. I was slightly disgusted with myself for paying over £100 for it back in the day. These days, according to eBay sold listings, some silly sausages out there are now paying up to £600 for a PAL copy, so demand for Saturn goodness is still on the rise. Regardless of the price though, one of the questions I wanted with my purchase was to find out if this really is the Sega Saturn's answer to Final Fantasy VII. Well, personally I don't think so, as although both games are absolutely amazing, they are too different to compare. On the surface, they may both be blocky polygon RPGs with pre-rendered cutscenes spanning multiple discs, but apart from that, they're nothing alike. Amusingly, after doing a little bit of reading, I would learn that this 1998 game was actually created to compete against Final Fantasy VII as a brand, so it's no wonder the comparison keeps being made. But the reality is that this role-playing game by Team Andromeda varies vastly with one of the most innovative features being the game's battle system. Never have I experienced anything like the fights in this game that mix real-time with turn-based elements. These battles involve circling around an enemy, moving between different quadrants, looking to expose enemies' weak points or escape positions where oneself is vulnerable. There are obviously layers to all of this that make the system far more intuitive than just that, but I am not going to over-explain and I just recommend you give this one a go for yourself. Oh, and don't worry, you do not necessarily need to pay £600, as there are other ways to play this game, but more on that soon. Guardian Heroes is obviously another one of the must-play Saturn experiences out there. 2D beat-em-ups such as Golden Axe and Streets of Rage were some of the key titles on the Mega Drive, so this game by Treasure of Gunstar Heroes fame could almost be considered the spiritual successor to those classics, bringing the genre to the next generation. What is unique about Guardian Heroes is that it combines Golden Axe-like play with RPG elements, bringing something different to the table. Branching paths and multiple endings also provide players with a reason to keep going back to this one more and more. One of the features that makes Guardian Heroes so novel is that the developers opted to make a 2D sprite-based title in a period where publishers were opting more and more to make polygon-based games. Meaning, for example, that Guardian Heroes delivers a very different experience from, say, Fighting Force. Treasure's decision to carry on developing 2D games, they put down to the fact that they felt that there was too much concentration on 3D games, with them wanting to build on their existing knowledge of working with 2D sprites. 
I for one am glad they kept things old school. From one beat not to the next, another must-own Saturn game is Die Hard Arcade. First released in the arcades as Dynamite Decca in Japan, this would reportedly be the first beat em up in history that utilised textured mapped 3D polygons. To give you a stronger idea of this game's calibre, it was directed by Makoto Yuchida, the same Makoto Yuchida behind the legendary Golden Axe series. Packed with sophisticated moves, quick time events, and a two player co op mode, this fun chaotic game delivers an experience far greater than what you would expect from it on the surface. The ability to combine items in order to make more powerful weapons also adds to this game's novelness. It's pure and simple action, but comes through at every stage. You obviously can't talk about the Sega Saturn without talking about Knights into Dreams. Produced by Yuji Naka of Sonic the Hedgehog fame, Knights into Dreams is a video game that was so innovative that even creator of Super Mario Bros. Shigeru Miyamoto has gone on record to state that he wished he had created this game himself. Acclaimed for its graphics, gameplay, soundtrack and atmosphere, it is no wonder that this game is a regular on best of all time lists. Giving players a compelling sensation of soaring in the sky, in this unique game you can perform graceful acrobatic stunts as you play through each highly imaginative stage. There really isn't anything out there quite like Nights into Dreams. Nights into Dreams though would not be the only new IP on the Saturn created by Sonic Team, as the Saturn is also home to Burning Rangers. Born from the idea that Yuji Naka wanted a game whereby you save people rather than kill them, the game is enough of a cult classic that some believe that this is the best Sega Saturn game ever made. Personally, I don't think the game was without its fair share of flaws, but it is certainly historically significant just based on who worked on this one alone. This third person shooter sees players take control of futuristic firefighters as they make their way through missions extinguishing fires and rescuing civilians. Set in a utopia where fire remains the only danger that remains, this is a must play Saturn game. A personal favourite from my collection, with I am sure it being the same for other Sega Saturn aficionados out there, is Saturn Bomberman. The game simply is what is described on the tin. It's Bomberman for the Saturn. In terms of the 2D classics from this series, this entry is refined as they come, possibly in part due to this title's fantastic soundtrack. The music in this game amusingly makes a title where you blow others up and risk getting blown up yourself an extremely relaxing affair. Indeed, this is the best Bomberman game that has ever been made. While these are amongst some of the most celebrated games on the platform and some of my personal favourites, this is obviously just scratching the surface of Sega Saturn goodness. The Saturn has a huge library, one of which is bigger than the more successful Nintendo 64 for example. There would in fact be over 1000 games released for the hardware, making it all the more frustrating that I didn't give the system a chance in the 90s. Out of a large list though, 785 of the titles would remain completely exclusive to Japan, partly due to the fact that the Saturn proved much more popular on home territory outselling the Nintendo 64 over there. A huge proportion of the exclusives were tailored for that market, consisting of large portions of JRPGs, fighting games and space shoot 'em ups Many of these games feature 2D sprite based graphics, an art style that lost popularity in the West in the later part of the 90s, but remained popular in Japan. The fact that the Sega Saturn is a 2D powerhouse would receive a great deal more appreciation in the land of the rising sun than it was overseas. In an amusing twist, the lean towards 2D gaming with the Sega Saturn has meant that its library has ended up aging like a fine wine, with the system offering up many of the most beautiful looking video games of that generation. While many of the popular games of the period now look like blocky messes, 2D Saturn games on the other hand look more appealing to the average gamer today than they did on release. With such a rich library of games in Japan, this has always meant that there has been a huge import scene that revolves around the Sega Saturn, with gamers procuring titles regularly from the East, from the 90s right up until this very day. In fact, with Sega America phasing out Saturn releases in the States pretty early on, due to its lack of sales, many video games that Saturn owners were heavily looking forward to were cancelled for the region before they even saw release. This meant that video games such as the amazing arcade perfect conversion of X-Men vs Street Fighter could only be played if gamers purchased a Japanese copy. There was enough demand for this title amongst Saturn diehards that many corporate store chains would opt to stock the Japanese version, 
meaning that consumers didn't need to necessarily arrange the import themselves. RAM expansion cartridges that could be inserted into the top of a Saturn, paired with a Saturn architecture that was already great with 2D, meant that games like X-Men vs Street Fighter for the hardware made the PlayStation version look embarrassing in comparison. The PlayStation didn't even allow for tag team matches as the system wasn't capable of holding four sprite based fighters simultaneously within its working memory. The Saturn on the other hand of its RAM cartridges handled such a task like a breeze. Speaking of fighting games, if you owned a Nintendo 64 through the period, the options you had as a gamer would be extremely limited. If you had a Saturn on the other hand, don't quote me on this, but I think I counted at least 70 fighting games in the past with some of the best of a generation all being around on the hardware. The Street Fighter Zero Trilogy, Virtual Fighters, Fighters Megamix, Marvel Super Heroes vs Street Fighter, Darkstalkers, Fighting Vipers, just to count a few. The Saturn has an insane selection of games that are available to play from this highly competitive genre. As mentioned earlier, shoot 'em ups also make up a core pillar of the Japanese Sega Saturn's library, with there being a ridiculous amount of these that can be found on the system. Easily the most celebrated of the bunch is the now legendary Radiant Silver Gun, another all-time classic that was produced by Treasure. Many refer to this title as simply the greatest game in the genre that has ever been made, with critics at the time claiming that it redefined the genre as a whole. The level of visual flair that was put into this one is mind-blowing, and even though this was a Sega Saturn game, somehow its polygon visuals managed to outclass every game from the medium even on the Sony PlayStation and Nintendo 64. It's games like this that helped define the Saturn's library's greatness. I could well and truly talk Saturn games all day, for example I didn't even get round to acknowledging the importance of Sega Rally or Daytona USA. This hardware has so much to offer, with many hidden gems available that the average gamer would not even be aware of. What is all the more glorious about the Sega Saturn is that as of today, to buy an original console, whether it be a Japanese system or an international model, they still seem to go on eBay regularly for less than £100. Hell, that's still a lot more money than the £2 I paid to get one from a boot sale a decade ago, but that is four times cheaper than the device was at launch. And that is without even taking the extreme level of inflation into the equation that has occurred over the last 28 years. Considering its relative obscurity compared to its better selling competitors, that means at this moment Sega Saturns are still an absolute bargain, so my advice to you is consider investing in one while these things are still running well. Now you might be thinking the hardware may be affordable, but the library right now is far beyond my price range, which to be fair, could be true. The prices of retro games has got well and truly ridiculous, with the price of most old games of these days being far more than what I personally would feel comfortable to pay. Thankfully, there are now multiple workarounds such as the Pseudo Saturn and Satiator that can be used in tandem with the original hardware, opening up this aged platform's amazing library to all. There is nothing like experiencing a classic game on the system that it was intended to run on. So with these modern exploits, the world of Sega Saturn is more accessible than it has been at any point in history, thus meaning that in my opinion, it is the perfect time to dive in. Building on this further, we have had Saturn gaming experience opened up to us in recent years that were not even possible in the decade the hardware was released in. Take Shining Force 3 for example, the top quality strategy role playing game that followed up on the success of its prequels on the Mega Drive. There would end up being three different Shining Force scenarios released during the Saturn's lifespan, but Scenario 1 was the only one ever to be localised. These days, English fan translations are available so that all three scenarios can be enjoyed by non-Japanese speakers, and dozens of other Japan-only Saturn games have now been translated too. As I've said before, there is no better time to become a Saturn fan. Most classic consoles from the 90s continue to have their moments in the spotlight time and time again. We have been given official ways for example to enjoy the greatest games of the NES, Super Nintendo and Mega Drive over and over again. With a Saturn on the other hand, players need to be a tad more proactive in order to access the brilliance of Sega's Forbidden Library. But after 10 years of fun with this device myself, all I can say is trust me, it's worth it. Experiencing the launch of a Sega Dreamcast in real time is one of those gaming moments that you tend to never forget. After all, this was a piece of hardware that was so ahead of its time, often you would power on games and not quite believe what you were seeing. 
This was an era when the term next generation game console still held gravitas, and the leap we saw between games on the Sega Dreamcast and those that were present on the Nintendo 64 and Sony PlayStation was a very visible generational gap. As for my first experience with the Sega Dreamcast, it was in my next door neighbour's house. My 15 year old friend had been working hard in the corner shop on our street, toiling away illegally working for £2.50 an hour. The London schoolboy's hard work would be enough to allow him to buy the new Dreamcast at launch, which would mean I too would get to experience a slice of gaming's future. The likes of Sonic Adventure with its insanely good graphics was a sight to behold, with Sonic being represented like he had never been before. But of course, the games were only just for start, as you could browse the damn internet using this thing, an option that felt like an entire new world was being opened up before our eyes. Using Dreamcast Online, we would claim his free copy of Choo Choo Rocket, which after a few days, felt like it magically turned up at his door. Typing in a few details on a game console to then have a game posted through his letterbox felt like witchcraft, like this couldn't possibly be real. To make matters all the more surreal, we discovered chat rooms, a feature that allowed us to speak to other people in real time from the comfort of our living room. To be honest, our primitive teenage minds couldn't think of anything meaningful to discuss with others, so we just chose to try and wind people up instead. Much like when we would choose to prank call random phone numbers regularly. Little did we know at the time, but we were taking part in an act of internet trolling, a practice that even your nan is likely to be familiar with at this point. But it was new territory for us through the magic of a Dreamcast. Through all of this, I knew I had to have a Dreamcast to call my own, but more on how I got my own later. For now, let's look at how this amazing system came into existence in the first place. Although they were still one of the biggest and most recognisable names in the industry by the time the late 90s came around, Sega's influence had dwindled significantly and their position at the upper echelon of gaming didn't seem quite so set in stone as it once did. Another entry in the extremely volatile and incredibly competitive and difficult to gauge console market could quite literally make or break the beloved Sega at this point so they had to be well aware that any repeats of the kind of costly mistakes and balmy decision making that they had been so guilty of in recent years could prove lethal to them. So a well thought out plan would be required if they stood any chance of surviving in the hardware market. But the big question going into this was, had they already done an insurmountable amount of damage that would seal the fate of their new system before it was even released? That was a genuine concern. So how had Sega found themselves in this mess? Sega laid some necessary foundations for the future during the 8 bit era, but ultimately failed in North America with their master system. It was their entry into the fourth generation of consoles, the Genesis, that really cracked the US market open for them, bringing their mainstream recognition and all new levels of brand loyalty. Genesis did what Nintendo didn't. The next few consoles and add-ons, however, were far less fortuitous for them, with each effort proving to be a financial drain. By the time Sega's 32-bit CD-based powerhouse, the Saturn was discontinued on American soil in mid-1998, the once highly respected Japanese gaming company had essentially produced three massive flops in a row, with the Sega CD, the Sega 32X and the Saturn all failing to reach anything like the success they had been expected and predicted by both the public, the press and Sega themselves. This period also marked the first time in over 12 years that Sega didn't have an active console on the home gaming market. Although the Saturn actually performed relatively well domestically in Japan, continuing to be produced and sold for quite some time after it was discontinued elsewhere, with a much richer and more varied library of games, the console's life in the States and in PAL regions was worryingly short. As far as Western consumers were concerned, there was no sugarcoating it. All three systems were huge disappointments, and the level of brand loyalty and consumer satisfaction that they had managed to build up over their most prosperous period during the late 80s and early 90s was at an all-time low. Relationships with third-party developers had also suffered after the shaky 32X and awkward to program for Saturn hardware had given many calls to drop off from projects and distance themselves from the company. Any new consoles from Sega beyond this point would be met with inevitable doubt and scepticism from media and consumers alike, 
which meant that their next piece of hardware would seriously have its work cut out for it. Following several years of dwindling sales and decline in profits, in 1998 Sega reported its first consolidated losses for a fiscal year since the company was very first listed on the Tokyo Stock Exchange in 1988. It was a troubling time indeed, with some reports estimating that Sega would have lost over $1 billion during the Saturn's brief yet costly life. To say launching a new console in these circumstances was risky would be a massive understatement. But given how far along Sega already were in the development of an all new next generation system at this point, the decision to continue with the project was made for them, despite the fact that another failure could cause the company irreparable damage. A Saturn follow-up had actually been discussed from as early as 1995, with conflicting reports suggesting Sega were either in the process of developing a Saturn II or a 64-bit add-on for the original console, but plans were scrapped before anything really got off the ground. It wasn't until 1997 when Sega of America's CEO Iri Majiri decided it would be in the company's best interests to look outside of internal development for the processing power of their next system that things started to get going and headway started to be made. Incidentally, Iri Majiri was the man that replaced Tom Kalinske as head honcho of Sega's American branch. The services of IBM's Tatsuo Yamamoto were enlisted by Iri Majiri to head a team of devs working on a secret project known only at the time as Black Belt. Sega America had partnered with highly respected electronics company 3DFX to use their accelerated 3D Voodoo processors on the new hardware, partnered with a Motorola Power PC600. But at the same time that all of this was going on, Sega of Japan had commissioned a team led by console king Hideki Sato to design a system using entirely different chips and processors for reasons that have never really been made fully clear. Sato's crew of tech cronies were using the new Hitachi SH4 processor, which was something of a follow-up to the one found in the Saturn, as well as the Videologic Power VR2 to soup up the graphics. This project was initially named White Belt, but was later changed to Jural, named after the Virtua Fighter antagonist. It seems pretty crazy that two branches of the same company were working against each other, essentially competing with themselves for the rights to have the say on the new hardware's innards. But this is Sega we're talking about here. All the criticism that the troubled gaming giants took about the Saturn's awkward and difficult to design for hardware seems to have really been taken on board by Sega, as they had entered into yet another partnership, this time with the mighty Microsoft to oversee the development of both branches' respective consoles, with an eye on making sure that the forthcoming system would be as developer-friendly as possible. Both versions of the new, as yet unnamed consoles got fairly far along into development, but in a move that will surprise absolutely no one that knows anything about 90s Sega, Sega of Japan did the dirty on their American colleagues and made the decision to go with their boy Hideki Sato and his SH4 driven device. It has been speculated that this was due to the political connections between the Japanese offices and Japanese company NEC, who are responsible for the Power VR 2 chip found in the Dural. But who knows what actually went on? This would obviously end up upsetting the nice folks over at Sega America to no end, who had numerous staff walkouts after the announcement was made, that all their hard work was essentially being flushed down the lavatory of gaming history. They weren't as upset as the 3DFX company, however, who responded by suing both Sega and NEC for breach of contract. This rather costly matter was settled out of court, but it proved a huge financial drain for Sega at a time when they could scarcely afford such things. In early 1998, with the decision to go with the Japanese branch's version of the system set in stone, Sega abandoned the dual moniker and renamed their new console Katana, although this was still seen as a placeholder name. They announced that the system would be ready for Christmas of that year and would ship out to stores in time for the holiday season. In May, new Sega president Iri Majiri unveiled the Dreamcast, its full specs and some swanky looking tech demos at a press event called Sega New Challenge Conference, giving the world its first glimpse of their revolutionary new device. A short six days later, at the 1998 E3, Wild-Eyed Madman and Sega of America Vice President Bernie Stoller unveiled the system to the Western world, with an expected release of somewhere in autumn of 1999. Quite the elongated period of gestation, if I do say so myself. 
The weight though was made all the more tantalising when we saw just how powerful and technologically advanced the Dreamcast was going to be. This little bit of kit was set to absolutely put all other dedicated gaming systems that came before it to shame. There was simply nothing that came even remotely close to matching the Dreamcast's graphical processing power or potential for technically impressive games anywhere else on the market. There were initial plans to leave Sega's name off of the final design of the system and its branding completely due to fears that the negative association that came with the Sega logo after the failure of the Saturn would tarnish their new console and potentially hinder its success. The idea was that Dreamcast would eventually become its own brand, similar to how the term PlayStation had worked for Sony, but this notion was eventually dropped. Being released to Japan on November the 27th at a price of 29,000 yen, the console's design and display options were massively forward-thinking, with a Dreamcast capable of outputting via S-Video, Composite or RBG at either 240p or 480i, and the system having a built-in 4-controller ports on the front, making multiplayer games a clear priority. Astonishingly, the Dreamcast could even output certain compatible games at 480p, provided you had a VGA adapter handy, which was unheard of at the time and was bordering on some Martin McFly level time travel skullduggery. Similarly, as discussed earlier when highlighting my early personal experience, internet connectivity was possible, with an included modem straight out of the box. Although, interestingly, this was scrapped on later models. With the Dreamcast, Sega were keen to avoid using the CD-ROM format, which had become prone to piracy in recent years, so instead opted to use the new Gigabyte Disc, or GD-ROM, which was developed in conjunction with Yamaha. Ironically, this supposedly piracy-proof medium ended up being one of the Dreamcast's biggest downfalls, as it wasn't long before the internet figured out exactly how to make copied Dreamcast games, both extremely easily and extremely cheaply, making Sega's new system one of the easiest to play pirated games on of all time. To compound problems further, the console's Japanese launch came with a rather meagre four games on release, including Godzilla Generations, July, Pen Pan Trisalon, and Virtua Fighter 3 TB, which was very much a system seller and the only really noteworthy title amongst the initial selection. Much like with the release of a Saturn just a few years earlier, almost every one of the 350,000 consumers that purchased the Dreamcast on launch day also bought a copy of Virtual Fighter. With a rumoured sequel to Sony PlayStation on the horizon, Sega were eager to get as much of a head start as possible and build a large install base in Japan, but unforeseen chip shortages meant that supply could not meet demand, and supposedly an estimated 3 to 500,000 extra units of the system could have been sold during its first month, had Sega been able to produce the consoles in time. Over in America, Sega and Big Bad Bernie Stoller were doing all they could to repair the damage done by the Saturn, making sure the Dreamcast would be sold in all relevant stores across the country, and repairing relationships with third-party developers. Hype for the system was huge, after word had got out about several quality games being released in Japan, such as Sonic Adventure and Sega Rally 2, and the mouth-watering announced price of $199. This meant consumers were chomping at the bit to get hold of Sega's impressive new console. Things were looking promising and everything seemed to be coming up millhouse for Sega and the Dreamcast, when at least until March the 2nd of 1999, when Sony held a press conference to announce the PlayStation 2. This was the news Sega feared as Sony revealed their new system would boast an impressive 128-bit CPU with graphical prowess that could apparently outperform even high-end PCs. It had DVD playback and backwards compatibility with Sony's previous PlayStation console. Bully Boy Sony had come and kicked sand in the Dreamcast face, stole its lunch money and flushed the platform's head down the toilet for good measure. The Dreamcast had gone from being the most technically impressive console ever seen to being overshadowed by the demand of the PlayStation 2 in an instant. Its release stateside finally came on the 9th of September 1999, or 9999, as the rather convenient, memorable slogan said, which was accompanied by the bizarre and often somewhat surreal It's Thinking advertising campaign, which seemed to confuse consumers as it wasn't really clear what Sega was selling or what drugs they were taking when they came up with it. <laughs> 
Just before the new kit was to be released in America, the shocking and sudden decision was made to fire Bernie Stoller and replace him with future head of EA Sports, Peter Moore, which must have been an extra kick in the teeth, given that it was Bernie that hired Moore in the first place. This placed Moore right in the hot seat for the big US launch, which actually ended up being the most successful launch of any home console ever at that point in time. A rare piece of good news in a story about Sega of America. A big factor in that success was the outstanding selection of games available. In contrast to the pitiful Japanese launch, American customers had a whopping 19 games to choose from, with highly desirable and several extremely fondly remembered titles amongst them, including but not limited to Power Stone, House of the Dead 2, Tokyo Extreme Racer, Sonic Adventure and Soul Calibur. What an excellent selection indeed. Sega couldn't ship consoles fast enough, and before two weeks, they shifted an astonishing half a million units. For a brief fleeting moment in time, the Dreamcast was the biggest thing in entertainment, and Sega looked to be back to their winning ways, once again ruling the gaming roost in fact. By the end of 1999, Dreamcast sales were at around 1.5 million, but by January of 2000, the almost inevitable decline started worryingly rapidly, and those sales began dropping sharply. Things went from bad to worse after the Japanese launch of the Sony PS2 in March, which absolutely destroyed Dreamcast sales in that region, and all but made their new console a dead system in that market in Sega's eyes. Entering damage control mode, both Sega of America and Sega of Japan put all their collective efforts into keeping the Dreamcast alive on American soil, which included developing a robust and extremely impressive of the time online service for a selection of multiplayer games, and an expensive advertising campaign which culminated in the company having huge visibility at the MTV Video Music Awards. And yes, as unbelievable as it sounds, they used to play music videos on MTV. All this extra effort ultimately proved futile, as the system's failure in Japan, as well as the decline of the arcade market, had put massive amounts of financial strain on the company. Moore had stated that they would need to sell in excess of 5 million Dreamcast units by the end of the year 2000 to even have a hope of staying afloat, and they unfortunately fell short of that number by a good 2 million. It has been stated that it would have been possible for Sega to pour enough money into the Dreamcast to keep it alive longer, but that could potentially come at the risk of bankrupting the entire company. So on January the 31st, 2001, the regrettable, no sad, no absolutely tragic news that Sega were leaving the hardware market and taking our Dreamcast away from us was broken. And on March the 31st, the console was no more. A mere 18 months after the biggest and most successful launch in history, Sega's gamble didn't end up paying off, and their final console was discontinued. It really felt like Sega got things right with a Dreamcast by the time it came over to the West. It seemed like they learned from their mistakes and produced a progressive, cutting-edge piece of hardware that would restore all of the lost faith in the company. The truth is, aside from a few clumsy missteps, Sega did almost everything right, and the Dreamcast should have been a runaway success. Unfortunately, it was doomed the moment the PlayStation 2 with its DVD playback was announced. Despite essentially dying before its time, those who experienced the Dreamcast in its prime remember it very fondly indeed, with I personally being one of those people. Playing the Dreamcast was magical. As highlighted earlier in the video, I'd first get to play mine round a neighbour's house, but I was yet to have a Dreamcast to call my own. I would get my own as a gift for Christmas of the year 2000, which would end up contributing to some memorable Christmases indeed. So let me discuss with you some of the key games I played and how I experienced them. Sonic Adventure is obviously a big one for anyone who had a Dreamcast, and I was absolutely blown away with the game's graphics. They looked a different league to the likes of Mario 64 and Banjo-Kazooie, but sadly, I felt the gameplay trailed well behind. The game offered some great blasts of fun, particularly when playing as Sonic, with a title lacked a true direction, and had too many flaws to be a true classic to me. But I will say, it was brilliant to see Sonic within such an amazing looking setting. Late into the system for lifespan, I got Sonic Adventure 2 as well, which in my opinion at least, felt like a step up from the previous offering, with more refined gameplay on display. But by far the Sonic stages, or the shadow ones that mirrored them, far outclassed those whereby you would control other characters. It felt like more emphasis was being placed on story and the series strange new characters than it was on gameplay, which seems to me the wrong direction for the franchise. That should be mostly about quick platforming rather than anything else. So Sonic in 3D was cool, but should have been a lot better. 
Now, let me talk about with you games that not only impressed me, but had me rubbing my eyes, being not quite able to believe what I was witnessing. I'm of course talking about the Shenmue games. In fact, I distinctly remember playing the first one on the Christmas it came out, with my grandfather coming into the room being confused that he was looking at a video game. It certainly had no resemblance to Pac-Man or Space Invaders, that was for sure. The at the time most expensive game ever made delivered to me levels of immersion I'd never found in a game before, with everything in the title feeling more realistic than anything I'd seen in gaming previously, and for a long long time after to be fair too. The world in the game felt very real, and wandering into the Game You Arcade for the first time is something I will never forget. Going to an arcade to play a video game within a video game felt insane, with me falling in love with Space Harrier that Christmas too. The release of Shenmue is also the first instance I can recall personally of seeing 80s nostalgia celebrated, which is very weird for a 1999 game come to think about it. Shenmue is set in 1986, so it's the equivalent of creating a game today and getting all teary-eyed about 2009. No one seems to have nostalgia for that period. Where's my video game set in 2009? The following year, Shenmue 2 would amaze me once again, mainly as it offered all the same bells and whistles, only this time the world to explore was three times as massive. The game set in Hong Kong has also led me to become perpetually fascinated with the walled city of Kowloon, which was once the most densely populated spot in the world. Demolished back in 1987 makes exploring the walled city within the game feel all the more mysterious, in turn helping to lead to one of the most memorable gaming experiences that I've ever had. It's just such a crying shame that we had to wait so long for Shenmue 3, especially bearing in mind that it was all around terrible and brought no resolution to the story. It was Star Wars sequel level bad. Skies of Arcadia was also a pretty big deal on the system, a massive JRPG in which you could roam areas in a similar manner to that of Ocarina of Time. This was not the norm in JRPGs yet, as the famous ones like the Final Fantasy games on the PlayStation were restricted to including pre-rendered backdrops like in Resident Evil. It's basically just a really solid role-playing game featuring turn-based battles to gain experience points, an overworld to explore using an airship, and six different regions in which the story takes place in. There are dungeons that must be explored and some really unique battle mechanics, particularly in relation to the game's airship battles. This is all paired with a great soundtrack that helps further immerse you in the game's world. It's a must-have, must-play title. Speaking of a Dreamcast library, the Power Stone games also brought unique gameplay to the table. These colourful arena fighters functioned as perfect chaotic party games that were fantastic to play with friends. The Dreamcast with its four controller slots in some ways felt like the spiritual successor to the Nintendo 64, in that this was the first new console since that one to come with built-in four-player support, something many of us had enjoyed and become accustomed to after the success of the likes of Mario Kart 64 and of course the legendary GoldenEye. This pair of Capcom games offered brilliant fun presenting yet another reason to own a Dreamcast. As highlighted earlier in the video, another one that blew so many of our minds was the weapons-based fighter from Namco known as Soul Calibur. Like many titles on the Dreamcast, this game looked absolutely gorgeous and offered great gameplay that could back its strong aesthetics up. To this very day, Soul Calibur remains one of the most critically acclaimed games of all time, standing alongside the likes of Legend of Zelda The Ocarina of Time and Final Fantasy VII. That's some impressive company. In fact, the game still looks graphically decent today, further illustrating the insanity that was the Dreamcast. Since we were on the subject of fighting games, the Dreamcast would be home to many classics, particularly those that featured beautiful timeless 2D sprite work. Like the Saturn before it, the Dreamcast was excellent at delivering 2D games, capabilities that both the Nintendo 64 and the original Sony PlayStation was not very good at. For this reason, the Street Fighter 3 trilogy for a long time would be exclusively available in the home for the Dreamcast, with the titles containing far too many sprite animations for gameplay to be replicated on the competition's hardware. Another huge one would be Marvel vs Capcom 2, which would offer up an incredibly huge roster of fighters, and more importantly, chaotic 3-on-3 three -three combat featuring a balmy amount of Marvel and Capcom characters. The game really illustrates the Dreamcast's 2D capabilities, as the Sony PlayStation wasn't even capable of holding four characters in its working memory simultaneously to even allow for tag team matches in the first Marvel vs Capcom game. But here is the Dreamcast on the other hand, handling six with ease, thus providing further evidence of the huge generational leap. 
from JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, Street Fighter 03, Rival Schools 2, and the Virtual Fighter games, the Dreamcast, like the Saturn before it, is another system packed to the brim with fighting game goodness. All this is obviously just scratching the surface, as there were so many amazing Dreamcast games. From Crazy Taxi to Virtual Tennis, Jet Set Radio to Space Channel 5, there is so much to love about the platform, beyond the colossal leaps it made through its graphical prowess. Oh, and did I mention the VMU memory units? Yeah, to be honest, retrospectively, they were mostly bloody pointless, but they seemed like a cool idea at the time. Primarily serving as memory cards, they offered additional features, such as displaying animations when we were playing games on the TV, and even offering some mini-games that could be played on the units themselves. All in all, adding to the Dreamcast's quirkiness and desire to appear futuristic and grab gamers' attention. Reflecting on all of this, the Dreamcast may have been Sega's last ever mainline home console, but what an impressive effort it was, giving us memories that will last a lifetime. The Dreamcast was essentially the first console that offered games with 3D polygon visuals that genuinely looked good, rather than us having to suffer through more endearing blocky messes. For this reason, Dreamcast games have on the whole aged incredibly well in most instances, graphically still holding up now. From what I've witnessed in gaming, we have never once ever seen a graphical leap in line with what was as impressive with the Dreamcast. The platform offers a great library of visually pleasing games that, thanks to the systems for controller slots, presents opportunities for some fantastic couch co-op. And oh, did I mention that certain units have no copy protection so you can play games burnt straight to disc if you please? Actually, I think I did, but I'll reiterate the point anyway. That is without even taking more modern methods into account of how you can take advantage of the Dreamcast's amazing library. All in all, it is an iconic system that every gamer should have in their collection. Anyway, if you enjoyed this one, you might enjoy my upload on this device that changed the Sega Mega Drive. Cheerio!